And nice to meet you, finally. All I had was his accent All right. Up until on the phone. Yeah. OK. So good morning. Uh, some of the things I was going to tell you have already been uh, reported. And so I'll try to go over some of these. I'm an epidemiologist. Um, I like to count uh, uh, events and diseases. And uh, that's uh, basically what I'm going to talk about. So first, uh, as was noted, um, I was a member of the panel uh, 10 years ago that uh, uh, from the National Research Council that prepared uh, uh, a research agenda for uh, elder abuse and mistreatment. I just wanted to tell you that we, we were among the first to name it mistreatment and try to get people to do that. And I was really pleased to hear Ron try to use that terminology. So I, I, I appreciated that. And I'll, I'll, I'll go over that. Um, so I, I want to say a little bit about how we count uh, cases. I, I'm, I'm going to try not to be didactic, but we have to talk about this. Um, the, um, the problem is that if we don't count cases with good definitions, we can't know how many people there are. And if we don't do that, we don't know whether our programs work in the community. So sooner or later, we're going to have to face up to it and do some counting that works, that's reliable, that's valid, that works in the next state. And, and, and in fact, we really need to do that. So here's what we do. Uh, we, we survey people. We look at medical records and other clinical records. We survey other professionals. We uh, look at other social and legal encounters, such as APS and police and the courts. And then something we don't mention too much, but we also do monitoring. I have seen uh, episodes of elder abuse in uh, in nursing homes uh, on, on tape, OK, because the tapes are out there. Uh, and, and I'm going to say something at the end about other kinds of, uh, of sensors. We also look at banking records. And so there's a lot, there's a lot to do here. And my, my argument would be that we need to look at multiple sources in order to get a better picture of what's going on in the community. Uh, Ron's so what question is, well, what do you do with the risk factors? And that's really important. But I don't think any one mode will do that. And, and, and so I think it is. Um, in fact, a problem. So all of these modes that I've told you about are very useful, and all of them are also flawed. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk to enough people. The people who probably need to talk to us the most aren't there. Uh, I, I think we need multiple modes of data collection. And my own view is that prevalent surveys by themselves, as important as they are, are not going to be sufficient. And we need, and we need to go further than that. Uh, we have lots of definitional issues. Uh, these have been raised uh, already. Uh, again, I like Ron's work. And so if one definition is an event where, where a policeman would have to uh, react, um, well, OK, try to operationalize that when you do your, when you do your next survey. So, so this is not meant to be critical. It's meant to just highlight how big a problem this is. Uh, some, of the, some of the things we deal with are moral issues. Some of them are things that need to be kept in families. A lot of them are things that have long historical roots within families. Uh, and uh, some of them, as was pointed out a moment ago, are iatrogenic. And, and, and so it, it, definitions are everything, and they're, very, and they're very difficult. So one of the things you will see in the literature, if you dig in, is whether, uh, uh, whether treatment of uh, pain is uh, uh, is a kind of uh, elder mistreatment, okay? If you don't adequately take care of somebody. Well, if you start using a lot of analgesics, you will get into clinical trouble sooner or later. And so the question is, how do you, how do you walk that line? And, and, and again, a definition. I, I like this. This is something from Kansas. Uh, I, I think a very thoughtful issue about uh, uh, elder mistreatment in the institutional setting. and. Uh, these questions were raised uh, by the law there about uh, if, you, if you force an elder to wash her hair twice a week, is that mis when she doesn't want to, is that mistreatment? Chemical restraints was mentioned. Uh, not honoring the holidays of all faiths. I mean, it goes on and on. And so definitions are everything here. And they, and, and, and they need to be worked out in a way that, uh, um, that we can understand. So uh, Mark will talk about 
the, the consequences. And I think the risk factors are pretty well known for a lot of it, not so much I think for financial mistreatment, but the other risk factors are reasonably well known and they've been discussed. And I've just listed them and, and uh, some of them are fairly straightforward. Others are, are, are really complicated like both social isolation and being exposed to a lot of people. Both of those may lead to uh, uh, mistreatment. And, and, and so again, uh, risk factors are important. But I just want to say that risk factors have been derived mostly from what we call case control studies. You have people who have been uh, uh, mistreated and, and controls who haven't, and you look at the differences. The problem is we won't really get very far unless we can do this prospectively. We, we just need to be able to identify people in advance and be able to say you're at real risk and how much risk, and then maybe we can intervene. Otherwise, the risk factors, I think, don't have the utility that, uh, uh, the, that in fact, they might. So as been said already, there are risk factors for being a perpetrator. Similarly, you can't be a perpetrator unless you've already done the act, and so you're looking at this retrospectively, and the question is prospectively, is it possible to identify perpetrators? And, and that's where I think the research, one of the research frontiers is right now. So let me quickly turn to prevention in our jargon, primary prevention for a disease is preventing it from ever happening in the first place. Secondary prevention is early, early detection, uh, such as uh, uh, colonoscopy. And tertiary would be, all right, you've got that. What do we do now to prevent progression of that disease? But the, so this works really well for diabetes and colon cancer and so forth. It may not work well for, socialists, for social situations like mistreatment that have long historical tales. And, and the question is, when does, uh, when does mistreatment begin? Okay, that's a, that's a very, very difficult question. But if you don't know that, you can't count the incidents, all right? And, and, and that, I think, is, is, is important to all of this. So I, I just want to introduce you then to the, to the fact that we are, as, as Pam and others have said, we're looking at a life course phenomenon here. Um, I, I want to make a case for that at the end. For secondary prevention, uh, we're, looking at, we're looking at preventing incipient or less detected elder mistreatment when in fact they have, uh, th th that a lot of the victims, because we know those risk factors also have other illnesses. So the question is, how do we bundle all the prevention for older people that we need to do when we're trying to prevent mistreatment? What do we do about cancer screening? What do we do about uh, cholesterol and high blood pressure? And what do we, what do, we do about diabetes and, 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 and so on? And we need to do all of these. And, 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 and I think a, a quantitative question is, how much do risk factors really help us? So you, you may know that more people have heart attacks who don't have high cholesterols than who do. And so, yes, we can pick, we can find some risk groups, but not really all of them. And so we need, we need to know more about all of this. I'm going to go on through some of this. So I'm going to finish with seven uh, things that I'd like to see done. Okay, this is, this is my chance. And so please you know, um, bear with me. Um, Pam, Pam and others have approached this. But I think we need a discussion of what is the role of elders in society. I think we've ducked it for the most part. And I've given you, and I've given you some, uh, uh, one reference, one recent reference that just tries to deal with this. But, but I think, uh, what, what kind of an issue is this? Is it ageism? Is it human rights? Uh, is it prevalent cu uh, cultural attitudes? Whatever it is, we need to talk about it. And I think we don't do that enough because I think, for me, that's at the root of a lot of what we're talking about. Okay, the second thing for prevention is I'd like to commend geography. And, and so here's three maps that uh, were from National Geographic, uh, measures of environmental violence in red, uh, uh, time travel within the environment, uh, subjective ratings of stress. And I think one of the ways we can begin to understand mistreatment additional way is are there neighborhood contextual factors that can help us hone in on where the problems are. We just need to do this as a practical matter, uh, not because it necessarily is going to 
is going to explain everything. So other techniques that we have that didn't used to be around are Google Street View. So we can actually identify a lot of people who might be in fiscal problem, which was just raised, um, by the quality of housing uh, and so on. Okay. The third thing is when does elder mistreatment begin? So I don't know that I've seen any real work about where I'd like to go, but I wanted to just show you quickly two studies about, uh, about abuse and violence in young women. Uh, and, and the first one, these, are, these, these all got a lot of press play a few years ago. Uh, there's a risk of, um, of, of victimization for violence and victimization as an adult. If you had unwanted intercourse, if you, if you were raped when you were a child, if you were beaten severely, why is that? What is it about being a victim twice? And the question is, why don't we ask those questions about older victims as well? And, 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 and what, is it, what is it about early childhood experiences? I don't, I don't think we've taken that far enough across the life force. Same thing has been done for attempted suicide. Again, another case control study. Um, uh, attempted suicides in adult women are more common if there's emotional abuse as a child, sexual abuse, battered mother. Why is that? And, 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 and I think we need to, to know that. And I think the life course issues are important. Okay, I'm probably the only one who's going to tell you today that there may be some genetic issues here related to uh, uh, victimization. And this is a study from science that actually looked at um, uh, a gene that uh, produces a neurotransmitter called monoamine uh, oxidase. It's an enzyme. Uh, and it, it just shows that, uh, 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 that antisocial behavior is related to childhood, in adulthood, is, is related to childhood maltreatment if, uh, if you have one sort of a gene relative to another. So I've given you the reference if, and you want to play that out. And I think we just, we just need to find ways to hone in. I'm not suggesting any of this is genetic at its, at its core, but we are genetic life force and, 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 and we need to think about it. Uh, it's there. Biomarkers. Other biomarkers than genes is another important area. Nobody talks about them. There, there may be ways of early detection of, uh, of abused older adults, uh, uh, such as, I'll just tell you one, which would be myoglobin, that is pigment in muscle. And so when you get traumatized, the muscle, the, that pigment gets into your blood and you can measure it in your blood. It's called myoglobin. And, and so there may be ways actually to identify with blood tests who might be at greater risk. I don't think this is going to be an answer either, but I think it needs to be pursued because I, th I think there just isn't enough knowledge of any of this. Sixth, I wanted to say something about um, forensic science. Uh, I may be the only one who talks about that. I think we can learn even from autopsies. We can learn from the, the anatomy of injuries. It's, it's not all about death. But we really can learn about uh, uh, from we can le learn about the consequences and I think some of the risk factors for elder abuse, and and if we uh, if we will turn to the forensic sciences and we just haven't done that. Okay, the last thing is elder uh, monitoring and telemedicine. So we're in an era where uh, we monitor everything: heart rate, blood pressure, uh, in the home, uh, and so forth. So why not measure social interaction? Why not, why not put together sensors for uh, social interaction? That's been done, mostly in the workplace, actually, not so much with, uh, uh, with violent crime. But the, but the technology is actually there. And since more and more people are getting smart homes where everything about that house is monitored, why not monitor social interaction and see if we can find those situations that are likely to erupt and, and, and in fact, use, uh, use technology to help us because it's a really big problem, as everybody said, and we're not going to be able to do it uh, one home visitor at a time. That just simply won't happen. Thank you.